Hello and welcome to In Conversation with the History Holders of the American Dance Therapy Association, a project made possible by the Marion Chase Foundation. My name is Dr. Jacelyn Biondo. When I first conceived of making these videos, I hoped to capture the words of the women who studied with the firsts in our field, Marion Chase, Trudy Shoup, Mary Whitehouse, Alma Hawkins, Blanche Evan, and Lillian Espinak. What culminated in the process was an opportunity to have these women share their stories and their memories in their own words, and to capture these parts of history for future generations. Thank you for joining us, and I hope you enjoy our conversations. I am with Dr. Martha Davis. And my first question for you, if you could share with whom and where you first studied dance therapy. I studied it with Irmga Britannia. Mm -hmm. uh, she was the dance therapist at a experimental day hospital treatment center for patients who were, came into the local hospital ER and were some directed to the, to the day hospital. Uh, this was a um, big question about the exact year. I think Irmgard had been there a year or two. The day hospital itself, I think was only, uh, um, it was very uh, two years old or so because it was an experimental setting. Par apparently funded with Kennedy, Funds. President Kennedy supported this, one of five in the country who were seeing whether they could treat schizophrenic patients uh, in a day hospital setting after maybe a day or two in the ER when they settled down now that they had medications. And they were randomly signed because they were doing research on whether it was viable to do. We're talking in the 60s now. And so this was led by a great innovator and also uh, a, a psychiatrist who became a kind of patron of dance therapy and creative arts therapies. Actually, wherever he was, he made sure there were creative arts therapists. And when he was the head of training at Hahnemann in, in Philadelphia, which became uh, later your school, um, he made sure that uh, there was a complete program and training for the creative arts therapists of music, dance, and uh, art. Dr. Zwirling. So Dr. Zwirling had hired Ermgard to be the resident dance therapist, which was a very new thing. Uh, and they had a resident art therapist. He also realized when he looked at Ervita and learned more about her, that she had a very unusual background. She was a, a dancer from Europe. She was a physical therapist at that time because she had left uh, Germany and had come before the war to get her sons out uh, because her husband was Jewish and they had emigrated and she had taken up physical therapy. And just as she had progressed as a physical therapist, the polio epidemic hit. So she used her dance training and her physical therapy training and her natural skills. She had very strong hands and of course was a great observer because she had studied levitation and, and different forms of movement observation. So she turned out to be extremely well regarded as somebody saving kids who were uh, at polio. And she developed all kinds of innovative techniques for doing rehabilitation of polio victims, which were influenced as much by her dance and movement observation training as they were by, oh, that might be an extreme thing to say, but then by her physical therapy. By that time, she was in her early 60s and she was interested and she just was doing private practice. She was not doing institutional work. She had always said and had written to Lavin herself in the 40s that she saw a place for something called dance therapy. Mm -hmm. It was in the 40s and she had sort of the healing aspect of, of dance. 
so she knew about Mary and Chase and she knew there was a ferment, a foment, if you want to call it at the time. Uh, and she, I'm not sure how she found the day hospital or they found her. There's some suggestion that one of the residents, this is also a training place for psychiatric residents. There was a suggestion that, that um, a woman who later became, worked with Kestenberg, uh, who was a resident doing a residency uh, period through there, either saw her or Dr. Zwirling saw her. They were actually neighbors on the same block in Manhattan. And I, I, somehow they met or somehow he got wind of her or somehow she got wind of him. Uh, but clearly from her Vita, she, he realized that she had something double to offer. She, was, she could do research, which they were interested in doing, and she could do the clinical work. I was there as a research assistant for the summer with a bunch of college students. I was I finished my sophomore year in college and uh, had gotten wind of this. That's the whole story, how I got wind of this place. But anyway, I was there to set some interest in psychology, not sure clinically what I wanted to do. Had no dance training except one course at the University of Rochester with Robert Cohen in the um, because um, that technique, his well, he he flew up to Rochester and he would give classes there once a week, and so that was what I had. It was a gym class, <laughs> or it served as a gym class, and I, did, I remember a lot of Graham-like kinds of preparations and stuff. Uh, Martha Graham had had a time at the Eastman School of Music, which is the Rochester University of Rochester. Anyway, so I, one day we were encouraged, we students uh, were encouraged to go to rounds. Uh, we could, we were interviewing people to see how they did afterwards. I was helping one of the researchers in some way for the demographics of the Bronx, uh, where this was. Uh, we were looking at the social, the social and community psychiatry was sponsoring this at Albert Einstein College of Medicine. And one day, the day room was where she did her, her session. And there was a glass thin kind of open area and a part with glass thin. And I saw this lady dancing with patients. Mm -hmm. And I just got fascinated by it. At some point, I also learned that she was going behind the one-way screen when the group therapy sessions were going on. We were allowed to do that too, mm -hmm. sit there. I was too very fascinated by the idea that she was looking at the movement of the patients uh, and that there was a whole possibility. She had brought lamentation to the, she had done the, one of the first books in English from, that used in the United States on lamentation, but she wasn't a notator of, she didn't use the notation for um, preservation of dances. She used it as a, to, to develop observations, I mean, herself. So I went to Dr. Zwirling and I said, I'm really interested in this. Is there any way I could kind of apprentice with her? You know, kind of, kind of and he said, yes. <laughs> so, I mean, I don't, it's a, an unorthodox kind of sequence, but they were really for education. They were really for experimentation. Uh, they were really for research. And I think he understood, although I was ridiculously young, he understood that Ermgard was not, she was a, a brilliant observer, but she was not a researcher. Also her English was full of very complex Germanic, you know, she, she, was, she was a brilliant observer, right? And that's the first, useful step in, in research. And that was what he understood. And so somehow he thought somehow her teaching me and my being a kind of interpreter or laying down or writing down or what I've got, which is what emerged, uh, we could make sense of what she was seeing. 
-hmm. And he always supported her research. He even would see family sessions just for her. In time, he would did a series of family therapy sessions, which was his specialty clinically, just so we could study them. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's how much he supported it. So that's how it gets started. Yeah, so I, I was gonna ask perhaps what drew you to dance therapy, but I think it wasn't necessarily dance therapy that drew you in, it sounds. It, it well, it, I, I didn't become a dance therapist. I, I wouldn't say that she taught me dance therapy. Mm. Um, I joined the sessions. Mm -hmm. uh, what was I doing? I'm not quite sure. I mean, I would <laughs> never say, I did, well, it's not, uh, okay, I say that, but I actually did join the sessions and I actually did have times when I did sessions. I'm not sure what, you know, this was a very improvisational period. This was the period of the very beginnings, you know, I mean, Marion Chase, of course, was much more established, but, but we're talking just a few years here, mm -hmm. plus or minus. And I was always working with dance therapists and I was always in the dance therapy department because um, I wasn't at that point a psychologist. And, uh, and, all the time I was at the day hospital, which was about three years, I was associated with that. That's what, and I, and I was doing research. In time, I more and more did just research, but it was always, there were two things about it. One, I was always doing work that had implications for dance therapy. And I was always using dance therapists for observers when I needed it, because they were better observers than anybody else and they were interested in it. You know, I mean, they had a natural proclivity for it and they wanted to do it, right? So Alyssa White and, and Mimi Berger, and they were going with me behind the one-way screen and we would, you know, I, and I was in their department basically, okay? So in, in the old days, I don't know if you know this, you're probably too young to know, but this was a fellow traveler kind of a relationship. I was a fellow traveler of dance therapy. Mm -hmm. And of course, when Claire Schmees and Alyssa White developed the training program, I was the third part of the developer of that uh, in terms of the planning of it, because Whirling supported it. Uh, I'm sure that we got an NIMH grant because of his help. The first internship was developed in his hospital because by that time he had moved to Lee Bronx, a psychiatric hospital. So it was all of a piece. And that's been my relationship since all the way through. Mm -hmm. um, my work is, especially with the MPI and some of the psychotherapy, I mean, I did psychotherapy research for the first 20 years in addition to all of the research I did on how do you study movement and uh, how are different researchers studying movement, what's going on. But I would not say, I mean, once so or twice uh, I became, I went to, there was a question of what to do after college. And I took a year working only with Thermgard. And by the end of that year, she was starting to move over to the anthropology project. So, I was more on my own, but we had a theme and the theme was uh, something that I did actually in college. I began to, to study it as a sort of college thesis. What are we seeing in these patients, even though they're not very, very disturbed looking, there are still movement details, uh, subtle details, and could we get that down? And Ermgard by that time had pretty much moved to the other project, mm -hmm. but I continued it. And we were also teaching by that time downtown mm -hmm. uh, to, to mostly dancers. Mm -hmm. So this, this kind of seeing and being in relationship with Ermgard and, and studying in this, this space, can you share a little bit about the particulars of studying under Ermgard and what that was like for you? We were a strange and odd couple, right? Um, she was about, I don't even sure, I think she was about 62 or three. She had very white hair from her neck up. She looked very old to me, but now I don't think of her as so old, but she did. 
from a da down here, she could be about 35, you know, so when her physically, she was amazingly agile and in great shape. I was 19. So <laughs> we were like this kind of odd couple. In time, the staff used to sort of fondly say to the art therapist, you need to get a Martha, you know, <laughs> you need to get a Martha. I remember that. And the, and, and the art therapist who was this lovely distinguished artist who was doing art therapy she didn't get it a martha she um you know she i don't remember her teaching or or having an apprentice or whatever but so we were not couple but ermgard had a kind of oh, it's, it would be such the wrong word to say a childlike aspect to her it, it's the wrong word because it's not it's like kind of Oh, yes, yes, uh, you know, it, it didn't, it was more a question of, I want to understand what you're seeing. This is my job. I want to, what did, why did you say that? You know, you know, okay, and she's starting to teach me to observe, all right? And she would do it in practical ways, right? And she would then, because she was going back and forth uh, on the summertime, to uh, London to, to study with Lamb and with Laban, and he died in 58. So that, that was earlier, but he had, she had begun going back to study with Laban while he was in this last period of his life looking at the effort uh, concepts. And then she continued with Lamb. And so she was, um, she was working on these, what became LMA and, and much more elaborate uh, than the early days. But, um, and so we would have these terms and she would try to explain to me these terms and we would, I would try to learn them and I would, I took classes with her downtown um, that for St. Paul A also uh, took. And so we were two apprentices really. Basically I became an interpreter her English was excellent, but full of impressionistic and long adjectives. And, and she wasn't, and she wasn't an American pragmatic, you know, this is this and the operational definition is this. And, and so she was always, you had to see, I didn't quite understand that, you know, or what were you seeing? And then I would look and then she would talk in a kind of, she, she was a strange mix of very practical and very down to earth because she was a, a physical therapist and very impressionistic yet accurate if that makes sense. In other words, and so what we got into at one point was that we had five cases. Uh, the first thing we did wrote together was this monograph that we wrote for Dr. Zorling basically, uh, because we had a grant and we're supposed to, this was actually funded, you know, these were funded studies. And I was writing it, trying to, as a translator to what she was saying and seeing, and I, as I'm trying to learn. Um, and <laughs> I'll never forget. Um, so we presented it to him. And he had always said, do not use analytic terms. Do not use tra traditional diagnostic terms. Do, you must stay with this medium. You, you use your own language movement. Don't uh, presume to translate them uh, and, and tell us what you see kind of thing. That was what you, he knew Ermgad was this, uh, uh, I'm sure you've heard the stories about her, um, but you know, he, he was very, very taken with her. And so, so we wrote this monograph and I diligently worked it like I was like, I was an English major at one point. I mean, I was supposed to be over there. And we showed it to him and a couple of the other psychiatrists were there to hear the report, you know, and Swirling looked and he said, well, this is kind of incomprehensible. 
And I was devastated. I mean, he, he didn't even say it that cautiously. If he meant something, he would just say, well, I haven't seen something quite so incomprehensible as this for a while, you know, and, and I was pressed falling. And he said, somebody looks very sad over there. You know, um, but Ermgard, Ermgard was unplugged. Uh, Blustered by it, and she left. She said, "No, I see. I, he has his idea. I see his point." And we, you know, and we redid it. You know, um, but that was my role. That was my role, and my role was always to try to see, understand why she was making the jump she was making. There were incidents which taught me most about what she was doing. She was not looking at efforts like strong like mm -hmm. she was not like that she was seeing patterns mm -hmm. and it took me a while to see are you seeing patterns mm -hmm. and you're using the language to describe the pattern that you see as a gestalt mm -hmm. you're getting the impression and you're getting how it's put together in movement mm -hmm. and you're pulling on the this language to to articulate it uh and so there shouldn't be counting things and, you know, that kind of thing. I learned that one day with her. There was one particular day, which I've often talked about, because it was mm -hmm. the aha day for me that, ah, I see what you're doing. It's, we would go down and count and make all these notations and then count them up to try to get a profile mm -hmm. for the sort of predominance of things. And then I realized that that's not what she was basing her her synthesis on. Uh, and so that the challenge was much greater. And ultimately I used that lesson to develop my, uh, my way of looking at individual difference, which I call signature analysis. So it sounds like the, the patterning and the way of seeing and patterning what you're witnessing is one of the kind of salient takeaways from studying with her. A absolutely the most important thing. Yeah. I, I know that when Imgard was, you know, we didn't do research that required coding. I did later, mm -hmm. uh, but even when I did research that was more formal research of coding, the, the MPI and the early versions of the MPI, it's based on patterns, mm -hmm. right? In other words, the, each item is a pattern. If the features are there in that form, then it gets coded. But it was not an elemental counting or, or and then constructing it. When Irmgard did the, the work in the Lomax project, they looked at pattern in a different way. It was very frustrating to her. I mean, I visited enough there to know some sort of direct experience of it. Ermgard, somebody like Ermgard, and I think Forsy as well, so much more complex patterns than were, were the focus of the study, the, the focus of this. And so they would look at all kinds of things in all kinds of te textured and complex ways from these different cultural samples. But the task was to follow the task that had been used for the music analysis, which was thematic characteristics that were could be seen in large cultural groups, not local or even regional uh, individual styles of dance and, and um, ritual. So it was very frustrating to them. It was a different task. And Irmgard never was, that was not, it's certainly not the way that she worked with patients or worked behind observing patients. She would come out of a session and she would just tell Swirling, okay, um, that young man is really connecting with you. And Swirling would say, you're kidding. I didn't think I, can, I got to him at all. Or, you know, and, she, and the next week he would be more connected mm -hmm. and she would predict it. And so Swirling was very taken by this because he, and he was very taken when the day that I said to him, I spent a lot of time on this film, this one film they had, which was the film with Ackerman and his family. And I 
looked at it and looked at the 16 millimeter film. And I had the, I did it the way we tried to do everything, which is with the sound off. Mm -hmm. And I worked out the patterns. There were four distinct patterns that he showed. And they were in a particular sequence and they were related to the way the therapist intervened and the family members reacted. You could see that visually. Mm -hmm. And so I looked at them over and over again and the pattern was a sequence which recurred. In other words, they went through one and two and three and then back to one after the intervention. Um, or actually it went one, two, or one, and then intervention, two, three, and back to one of these particular patterns. And I said to, to Dr. Zooming, I said, I, when I turned the sound on, they corresponded each to a different clinical state. They, the first one was word salad. The second one was coherent, but, but momentarily catatonic mm. and not saying a word. The next one was a raucous kind of outrage, uh, uh, paranoid thing. And then it went back to word salad. And Swirling said, looked at it and said, it, you know, it was the kind of thing I could tell. He would, he would nod his head and he would say, okay, you know, that's, that's, really cogent for what might be useful for. In fact, uh, um, Ackerman himself had said after the session, he was very discouraged. He thought it had gone nowhere. Mm -hmm. And in fact, it had suckled back. So, so these, there were people there that, and particularly uh, that, who understood what we were trying to do. And then I went to graduate school and to become official somehow. <laughs> right. Of all of the knowledge that you gained around observation, some participation with clients or patients at the time, some with arm guards, some of observing, um, is there a particular experience that comes to mind that you would say would have been most meaningful in that time for you? Um, I think, no, the, the most meaningful, well, the, the, the Ackerman family session experience was sort of coming into my own mm -hmm. of, of, ah, now I see, because by that time I was working alone because I was, and, and also I was clearly going to go towards psychology in some way. Um, and so now I was beginning to, to do research all the literature um, so I was becoming very, very interested in method. Uh, how do you capture what Ermgard did intuitively? Mm -hmm. you know, how, how do you do justice to that? Um, certainly it has to be important for dance therapists, but it also has clinical re relevance for any, all kinds of therapists. And it's also about the nature of movement in relation to uh, clinical states and you know, things like these issues. So that was a big one. The other one was the, the one that I described when back in my training time when uh, we were behind the monitor screen when we would routinely go to the group therapy, watch the group therapy sessions and the sound broke down and the other staff people left because the sound broke down. But Ermgard and I were delighted, you know, because we could look and there was a new patient. She was a bit unusual for that population. She was rather vivacious, if that's the right word. I mean, she was rather animated, let's say. She was talking, right? She was not withdrawn at all. She was talking. We could see she was animated. We knew, she, you know, she was clearly talking to people. We decided to focus on her because we had, didn't know anything about her and she had just come in. And, uh, and I was told her, don't say anything to me. I'm going to do it myself. Right. And I started to write all these hatch marks and things of direct and stuff. Ridiculous. 
didn't have any to do any. But Ermgard was also taking notes. I mean, she would take notes. It's just that the notes were not what she was doing. I mean, maybe she used them to focus. You know, maybe it prompted her. But she's writing furiously, and then she's saying, oh, very interesting, never saw it quite this way, never saw it quite this way. I, finally, I gave up. I said, what are you talking about? She, you know, and she said, it, 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 no, it's really interesting. I, I, I'm just a woman is suicidal. And I said, what? You know, she's, she's a dino. She's like, mm -hmm. doesn't. And somebody, it's not an apocryphal story. Somebody just fixed the sound on at that point. And the woman was describing a very serious suicide attempt the week before. So that kind of gives you pause, right? I suppose in the traditional psychiatric terms, it would have been evidence of a uh, agitated depression. But I then said, Ermgard, you've got to tell me why you said that. You've got to explain why you said that. And then we went over it and she explained to me precisely the pattern. It was the pattern of impulse constricted. And she made an interesting observation later. She said, you know, the nurses described being uncomfortable around her. But that was the day I said, oh, you're just thinking. You just happen to be able to see in pattern boom, like that. And you get the salient recurrent pattern in the person. The person, I mean, it was repeat, a recurrent pattern. So that was a big one. Uh, the Ackerman family thing was a big one. The time that I was asked when I was a, already a, had been in clinical psychology and was doing my internship at Einstein and got appointed to the Bronx Psychiatric at that point and was with the residents. Okay, so I'm an intern in their residence. And one of the residents came to me saying, you, you, you know a little bit about dance therapy, don't you? And I said, yeah. And he said, um, well, I have this patient. You know, she's very been in the hospital many, many years, but she's pretty spunky. And um, we're having sessions because they would assign the residents different patients. And she had a long history of chronic uh, symptomatology. And she just told me today that I can't help her because it's about her body. And one part goes one part way and one part goes another. And I said, wow, that's really, that's really impressive that she's so in touch with that. I don't, I, 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 people don't usually articulate that. So, uh, you know, and he said, well, would you do a consult with her? Would you do uh, a session with her? And I said, okay. I mean, it's, it wasn't my job description at the time, but I said, uh, sure. I uh, found an empty room. And we worked on uh, running and getting going together and getting into synchrony. And then she jumped up in the air and she landed in a whole piece and just grinned like thrilled. To be and I said, "Wow, okay, I'm a, I'm a committed. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a supporter. I mean, this is this was really, you know." And she she continued with them. Of course, she, you know, I don't know whether she ever got out of the hospital. But she, this one was very chronic. But but that was okay. This uh, this is where the application of all those patterns that we saw. Mm -hmm. Uh, belong mm -hmm. and um, well, it, it, and always it's been that way mm -hmm. that that the, that the dance therapists were really the ones who would most understand, most make use of. Even the, some of the later stuff I did that wasn't therapy related, I was thought should be on the agenda for the dance circus because mm -hmm. it was uh, uh, just a movement. So that's that's those were the the kind of dramatic moments. Uh, and there were others with different people and different things that Ermgard did. I mean, Ermgard did her own magic of, of in the therapy. 
Well, that's what I was going to ask is, is there um, like a moment of saliency like that, that you remember witnessing between, between Ermgard and one of her patients? I, it's funny part about it is that there are two incidences, but, but one was described to me by Dr. Zmerling and one of them was described by Ermgard herself and I didn't see them, mm. um, but they were so dramatic that they stand out. The, the sessions I saw uh, were, they were, there were interesting moments to them and I, but I was trying to make sense of what was going on. Um, but when Dwarling told me the, the incident that sold him, <laughs> um, I thought, wow, I understand because she had, she got a completely catatonic young man to jump up and start moving with her. And he happened to walk by and see it. You know, it's really nice if you, if you've kind of been hired on on a conditional basis, and, and you, you know, begin to dance with a, somebody who hadn't moved for three or four days. Um, mm -hmm. That uh, just by the way she approached him, the one that I do, that she told me about was um, with a a young woman kind of heavy set woman. And for some reason, they were using it in the room, they were moving, having an individual session in the room where there was a pool table. Now, I mean, nobody thought, you know, that might be a little tricky there, pool sticks are there. The woman was, was very troubled and she grabbed the pool stick. And she was clearly bigger in a way than I'm going to hear this. And she went to hit her with it. And her guy grabbed it. So both of them are holding on, right? And for 10 minutes, they wrestled with this word. And they just. And Ermgard was strong enough to, to, to sustain that, clearly, no matter the age difference. She was really, had incredibly strong hands and arms. And so they, no, nothing was said. It was completely a, and she did all the twists and the turns and she got it going, she did all this with this incredible strength, both not and not. And then the woman stopped and said, thank you. And that was it. So I, these are really, you know, they're all pure movement um, dialogues. And that was in the early, in the middle 60s. So, so those are the ones that come to mind. Mm -hmm. So thinking about all of what you shared regarding the movement observation skills and the dance therapy sessions that you witnessed and some participated in and um, thinking about the way that Ermgard shared knowledge with you. If you were to think about takeaway points or knowledge that you would want to continue to be transferred through the next generations of dance therapists, what would that be for you? Well, that's, uh, well, I'm in the period, it's funny, uh, because I'm in a period of great review of that question. Mm -hmm. um, because in fact, by the time we started the Hunter program, we had a plan. And my, my, and what I brought to the table was, I think that I've studied all these really, really interesting researches about what you can see in movement, not just from dance therapists, but from bird whistle and shuffling and ritual and interactions. And I was steeped in this. And I said, this is, some, this is material that dance therapists should be part of their armamentarium. And so we literally, from the beginning, had course in addition to the clinical courses and the formal courses in dance therapy that Claire and Melissa did, I was doing the courses and observation and the studies of movement. And we even had a grant that would eat your heart out. We had a grant that allowed us to bring bird whistle and equine and these 
unusual experts to Hunter for our dance therapists. And because they all recognized Ermgard. And also because by that time, a chaplain came because of Zwirli and Ermgard to Bronx State. And the, the idea was that you would learn observation and you would learn how other people see it. You would train in observation in movement terms. But we were, both Forestine and Ermgard and I had started the effort shape analysis of movement training program down at the Dance Notation Bureau. Uh, in 65, within two or three years of when I started to work with her. Prematurely, probably, but anyway, there we were. No, but the dance notation people were very gracious to put up with us. You know, I don't know what they're doing back there, but there were, we had, we began to do that for a number of reasons. So although most of the people were dancers and some were dance therapists, mostly for dancers. One was interested in behavioral research, uh, Alison Giblanco. And a number of people were coming in. I was interested in the research part and we needed trained observers for research. So we were doing that already, you know, and that evolved into the, the LIMS program. So there was an idea that a dance therapist should have, you know, that there was a way to expand one's observation skills, uh, observation without labeling this means this and that means this and this is good and that's bad and whatever mm -hmm. also for their thesis and their research that they were going to do so it was already a part of it and i taught that there for two or three years so what would happen is that over the years the people we would we gathered again at the key study of the mpi the more developed with, with Mimi Berger and Hedda Lausberg. Uh, years later, I always kept up with the MPI and I would teach it. I taught it in London. I taught it to two dancers, dance people in London. Uh, and I would teach it. And then I began to do research uh, because uh, Dr. Zwirli moved to Hahnemann and uh, I did research there. Uh, and that was a program that was run by Diane Duica by that time. So there was this sort of, it was always woven into it. Um, and I always thought that um, the people who could understand what I was doing the most would be the dance therapist. And the, the material itself that I was into for mo most of the time was most applicable in terms of application. In those years, there was very little research on psychotherapy and movement you know, traditional talk type psychotherapy. I did thesis advisement with people who did that and Dean Haddix who uh, did this. Dr. Zwirling actually arranged to record one there, a therapy. He, he was doing a therapy to teach residents and he had a young woman he was working with and in good form, good, good Wesselian form, he would come to his session. He had gotten all re she was an outpatient person. She was not a very useful person. And he would put the camera on both of them, right? Like it was supposed to do. Uh, and he would record and she sent it to that. And then I heard that he had 60 sessions and that he was using the, the resident train. And I said, can I approach the young woman to see if she would get permission for us to study them? And she did. And so, we took 10 of them. A dean did this for his dissertation. So that kind of thing was um, the, where I was going, so to speak. And uh, I think I've lost track of your question, though. <laughs> yeah. I can focus. I think, you know, we were talking about um, what you'd like to see passed on. And what I'm hearing so far is the significance of the history of movement and observing movement. I'm yeah. hearing research come up quite a bit and I'm hearing collaboration, like interdisciplinary co collaboration oh, yeah. as yeah. well. Yes, I mean, it was always, I mean, Mimi took the project that we did at Downstate with Hedda and made her dissertation and Robin, thank God called me up and said, um, don't you have a lot of data that needs analyzed? <laughs> and she, she, 
really rescued that project because she really uh, massaged the data. And that's not in a pejorative term. I don't mean that in a pejorative term. But she really discovered that it was not a one-to-one -one symptom diagnosis. It was not disorganized movement in these different four forms. It was not pathognomonic of, the, of, the, of a diagnosis like schizophrenia. It didn't fit a spectrum model. And uh, you could have those things in a whole range of uh, people who were uh, in therapy. And you had to refer buys your understanding of what it was. So those were really very, very great collaborations. And now, of course, with Hedda, Hedda's gonna blow the roof off of it if she ever gets, <laughs> if they don't stop put, working her too hard um, uh, because of the neuropsych part, the neuroscience part, which is, I, I mean, it's a whole new thing, yeah. really profound implications. And movement is profoundly embedded in it. So, mm -hmm. so I think that, that this is a great time. As Hedda said, it's a great time to be a dance therapist. Mm -hmm. But I feel, as I said, that more depending on the programs and how it is, and maybe I've gotten really very rigid in my teaching of it, I tried to make it more accessible. Like in the first times, like when I was teaching it in Europe, I would go over each category and I would try to demonstrate it. And we'd, it was kind of laborious, you know. I tried to get away from that. Uh, it was very hard to get good video to show. You could demonstrate and of course you could get people to experience what they could do and what they couldn't do and these things. So there was always a problem of how to make it accessible. But it became more of an issue when it was clear that some people didn't want to work with schizophrenic patients or people who, who might have these signs. I mean, uh, Serge, is, my husband's a, a, a therapist um, and he absorbed some of this by osmosis over the years. And he, he began to use the concept like in clinically on very rare occasions where he would say he would somehow noticed that the person was a, a momentary kind of disorganization. It wasn't diagnosis of schizophrenia. He just said, something is really in conflict big time in this moment. Mm -hmm. And he would then focus on it. He would make sure it didn't get by and then they would get into something deeper. So he, you know, you could use it clinically uh, in all kinds of contexts, but there's still, not relevant to people who want to work with Parkinson's. I mean, it, it's, it is relevant a bit, a little bit in the immobility stuff, but I think the, so I'm proposing that the course be changed. Those who are discussing the changes that, that it, there be some way that you can get some background in the discoveries people have made that are important and standing. But then when you want to focus on something like the MPI or Parkinson's or working with Parkinson's or something, you, you, you get an idea, see whether you want to have any reason to go into it, and then you specialize. The course bifurcates in some way so that you can um, do the part of observation and understanding of movement that is in your group of people you want to work with. I'm not sure that answers you the question that you I think so. I think so. Yeah. So just um, to wrap up, thinking about, you know, this, this opportunity that you had to study movement with Ermgard and the experiences that were afforded to you in the, the hospital that you were working at that no longer exist and having um, a psychiatrist on staff that was really supportive of the creative arts and just... He was, he was the, the big cheese. Yeah. You have the big cheese behind you. He and was... He was making it happen. Yeah. So thinking about all of those components and all of the wisdom that you've kind of absorbed and shared over the years, are there any final thoughts around, you know, the field of dance therapy or of movement observation, just any final things that you'd like to, to make note of or share? I think the whole thing about movement observation is misunderstood in some levels. Or I'm getting a feeling that, that 
that there's a misunderstanding of what the methods are, what is effort, you know, what is lava and work element, what is, is a misunderstanding of that it's a somehow a, um, a formal set of privileged, you know, put in some sort of hierarchy of importance or value or most insightful or most, uh, you know, uh, that is really a complete, if that's the case, and to the extent that that's the case, I think that's a very big misunderstanding of it. Now I'm biased because I spent a gazillion years and at the same time reading everybody else's research to see what are they looking at and what are they finding kind of thing. I'm just fascinated with methodology. I'm fascinated with what choices to make uh, and why if you look at this, you get this kind of information and why if you focus on this and this, you get this kind of information. It's such a complex subject that, that these systems, uh, it would be a shame to rule them out. And I know there, there's this movement now to maybe decrease LMA training. It's, it's like, that's a false frame. You don't decrease LMA training. I mean, you can, and, and LMA people say, you don't have to teach it. I mean, we can teach it down in limbs or whatever, if you want. It's, it's, what is the issue that that is bothering people? You know, what is how is it being te taught or misused or uh, considered biased? That is, people are reacting so so uh, viscerally to that they're thinking about cutting out. It's like, and as I, I mean, said, it's like asking a musician to say, "We're going to knock out all the pianoforte and." Excel around the, we're going to knock out the recordings of dynamics. That's not something that's full of bias or something, or I don't know what, you know, it's, it's all systems of description are shaped by the culture, shaped by the individual, shaped by the personalities, I mean, uh, but these systems have, are 1500 years old and they've been I mean, one part of a lab annotation is reviewed all the time by ICO, the International Council of Kinetography Laban, which meets in regular points. People from 25 different countries belong to it, experts in observing, right? Going over where it's limited, where it doesn't do it, where it's not accurate, constantly modifying it. You know, it's like, that's why I'm upset about simplified reactions, that it's somehow um, scientific in a way that is biased and not the way people in different cultures would think or experience movement. It doesn't wash with the reality of what it is. Right? Yes, it comes from Europe. Yes, it comes from the United States. And yes, there are a lot of people, but it's around the world now. It's constantly being modified and it's constantly being expanded and it's constantly including more things than the original things. So, so if you don't understand that and you don't realize you can pick and choose uh, and that any project will pick and choose and select uh, because it is so complex, it's gotten the things that you can see in movement are so complex. And then you're talking about patterns and cultural differences and individual differences that um, I'm afraid it's getting into some sort of us and them thing that is, um, it, 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 I don't know what's gonna happen with that, but, but I don't do LMA. I do movement observation. If I, I just find that it captures some of the dimensions that a lot of other things don't capture. 
it's been modified six ways from Sunday over the last 40 years. So, uh, or made more subtle and complex and captured. And it can do things that it can get. I learned, you know, where I learned about um, polyrhythms? When I was sitting with Ermgard at the Lomax project one day, I said, they're talking about polyrhythms because they could see it. Did it end up on the on the book of choreometrics? No, because they described aspects of the polyrhythms in a particular way. So, and then that became, oh, you don't see polyrhythms, right? And the, there, we could go through everything like this. We could go through that that wherever Laban was working, he was working with two and three and four people. There were people contributing all the time. Uh, so it's not one man's thing, he wouldn't recognize it. He didn't recognize La Meditation when he came after his first inspiration from him, he came back after the war and said, oh, what are you guys been doing? You know, I mean, you literally, they, they were, the Europeans were, the Eastern Europeans were cut off from the Western and then they got together and they both been working, working, working and they both get together and made echo so they could, expand uh, and he wasn't interested in all that detail apparently uh, so it's not his his he he drew from the French Fourier notator the first notation so you know uh, there's a lot of um, I don't know I know people talk about you know this is healthy and that's not or this is this you know efforts are more important than everything else they are not more important than everything else um they but you sure don't disregard them you know um that's what usual researchers do you know they don't see movement if you're going to see movement which is the hardest thing you've got to be open to to dynamics and, and they don't see movement, they see things that are done in actions and freeze things and positions and direction. You don't see movement most of the time because uh, it's so, so hard. But, but dance therapists do. Mm -hmm. So, so I, it, I find it very upsetting uh, because I think, I don't know how to, I think I've, been too isolated or I did, I've not can taught it well clear enough uh, or whatever. And so that I, I mean, we will try to revise it mm -hmm. and do it in a way that, that this, now that doesn't speak to, to stupid things or, or, or offensive things that, that, uh, that Laban may have wrote. I just cannot imagine that a hundred years of work by other people would be put into question because of some stupid things that somebody wrote. Uh, and I don't think that he was a, a raving Nazi at all. Um, I think that there were many people, many of them Jewish who stayed way too late in Germany because Germany was the place to be if you were an artist or if you were somebody innovative at the time, you know, but that's another story. I don't want to get into that. Uh, does that answer your question? Yeah, I mean, it was just what else you wanted to share. And it really sounds like, and from conversations you and I have had, it sounds like you are really open to not having static tools that just were created and exist, right? That, that these tools were created and there is room for growth an expansion within them as a every foundational. Project, every project, mm -hmm. every attempt, every bit of work is, is something. First of all, there's not nearly enough done and there are no funds to do what all that could be done. So, you know, that's not the fault of the people who, um, who are mostly women, mm -hmm. don't have access to the funds, who at least historically have depended on uh, a few angels or Medici sponsors, you know, like swirling. Yeah. So uh, that's the thing. It's, it's, there's misunderstanding and some sort of rivalry that people, some people can see and some people can't, or some people got this, you know, whatever. And uh, that, that, 
guys doing a little nuts. Um, so, yeah. Well, I wanna thank you so much, Martha, for taking this time to talk and share your information. Um, Pleasure. Appreciate yeah. it. Good luck with your project. Thank you so much. Okay.